This media has been made available by Mosaic Boston Church. If you'd like to check out more resources, learn about Mosaic Boston, or donate to this ministry, please visit mosaicboston.com. You know, it's Easter, and a lot of people say Happy Easter. I, uh, I like the historic Christian call and response on Resurrection Sunday. You say, Christ is risen, and then you say, Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Amen. So you guys have heard the message. We don't need a sermon. But we want a sermon. Praise be to God. Uh, would you please pray with me over the preaching of God's holy word? Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that in love you predestined your elect to salvation, and you procured that salvation through the submission of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you lived the life that we were supposed to live, a life of perfect obedience to you and service to neighbor, a life of love toward you and love toward neighbor. We sin, Lord, and we deserve the cross. We deserve the wrath of God, and we deserve it for eternity. But Jesus, you took it on the cross uh, full throttle. You took all of it down to the very last drop. And we thank you for that. And we thank you, Father, that you accepted that ransom, that sacrifice, instead of us in our place. And you proved it to us by the resurrection of your son, Jesus. We thank you that you laid down your life and you raised it up. We thank you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we can also today be resurrected in our souls. And I pray if there's anyone who feels dead to you or death toward you, a death of relationship, death of love, a numbness on the inside, I pray today, Lord, quicken, bring people alive. Uh, tell their souls to come alive and draw them to yourself. And Lord, as we meditate upon the resurrection of Christ, I pray embed these truths into our hearts and minds that this is true, that this is a foundation that we can build our lives on. Because Jesus came back from the dead, everything he taught was true. And Jesus, you taught that the word of God is the word of God. So we turn our attention to it today. We pray, Holy Spirit, move powerfully in this place and begin a, a great work in our lives even today. We pray all this in Christ's holy name. Amen. The title of the sermon today is Believe Because It's True. Uh, Easter falls on a different date every year, which in and of itself is evidence that what matters most isn't the date of, of Christ's resurrection, but the fact of it, the truth of it. And we've been in a series at Mosaic going through the Gospel of Mark. We entitled the series Kingdom Come because the King of the universe, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Son of David, the anointed king to rule over an eternal kingdom. He's come, and to establish his kingdom, Jesus Christ took on our greatest enemies, Satan, sin, and death, and Jesus dealt all three a death blow on the cross. His crucifixion wasn't a secret. The religious epicenter of the world at that time, Jerusalem, swelled with hundreds of thousands of Passover week worshipers, and they bore witness to the whole gory event. Although we don't have the precise date of the resurrection, it did happen at a precise date, at a precise time, at a precise location. The corpse of the man Jesus Christ of Nazareth, marred beyond recognition because of the trauma, was quickened. He was dead, and then in an instance, he wasn't. He passed from death to life. And this event, which really happened in real time, in a real place, in reality, not just religious, mythical fiction land, this is the cornerstone of the foundation of the, for the truth about all reality. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Therefore, everything he taught is true. And that's why you should believe it. It's true, therefore believe it. Your believing doesn't make it true. Your believing is submission to the fact that it is true. Had Jesus Christ remained in the condition in which the women expected to find him on Sunday morning, dead, Jesus would be nothing more than a curiosity of history who may or may not have made his way into Josephus' antiquity of the Jews as but one in a string of zealots or prophets who opposed Roman rule. Christianity would have ended well before it began, 
Let's be clear, if Jesus did not bodily rise from the dead, then Christianity is not and cannot be true. Everything hinges on this. Christianity is founded upon an empty tomb because Jesus was raised from the dead. The resurrection is presented as a historical fact every bit as much as Jesus' crucifixion. If this account is true and Jesus was raised from the dead, then Christianity is true whether you believe it or not. And you should believe it. Because Christianity offers the only holistically compelling answer to the most pressing question of every single person's life. What happens when I die? Blaise Pascal and his Ponce famously observed, it's not natural that there exist men who are indifferent to the loss of their being and the perils of everlasting suffering. With everything else, they're quite different. They fear the most trifling things. They foresee them. They feel them. And this same man who spends so many days and nights in rage and despair over some loss is the very one who knows he's going to lose everything through death. But he feels neither anxiety nor emotion. It is a monstrous thing to see one in the same heart at once so sensitive to minor things and so strangely insensitive to the greatest. It is an incomprehensible enchantment, a supernatural torpor that points to a supernatural power as its cause. And it's so insane to be indifferent about death that there must be some supernatural veil over the human heart. And there is. It's an anti-God state of mind. It's a death toward God and death toward even meditating upon all the most important questions of life. And how else can we explain such a strange indifference to our greatest enemy, death itself? You know this indifference in yourself, and you've definitely seen it in others. It's as if death doesn't exist much of the time. People think, speak, and live as if they would never die. When the fact that they will die is the most certain fact of their existence. Distracted indifference is the only livable solution. Because if you honestly think about death, what happens? The natural reaction is fear. Hebrews tells us a man lives his life in bondage to the fear of death. Job 18.14 says, death is the king of all terrors. And some of it is the fear of the pain that goes with dying. Some of the fear is the personal loss of the inevitable effect. And some of it is the fear of the unknown. But most of it is Fear of God and judgment. Is there a God and is judgment coming? And for those who say, well, indifference is the only path forward since we can't know, we can't know is also an answer. But it's wholly unsatisfying because it's false. We can know because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And Christianity offers the most holistically compelling answer because it's true. Today we're in Mark 16, 1 through 8. This is the concluding sermon of our series through Mark. It's not the final sermon because we still have four chapters to cover. So come back next week as we're in chapter 12. But this is the concluding sermon. Mark 16, 1. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week when the sun had risen... They went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled, rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. And they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the reading of God's holy, inerrant, infallible, authoritative word. May he write these eternal truths upon our hearts. We'll meditate on three resurrections today. And those are our three points. The first one is the first resurrection. Uh, when Jesus and the disciples had finished the Passover celebration, Jesus had instituted the Lord's Supper. Jesus and the disciples went to Gethsemane to pray. 
And there Jesus was arrested while his disciples fled in terror. But the women who had been with Jesus from the beginning remained at the foot of the cross to the bitter end. They were willing to die for Jesus. Peter boldly declared that he was willing to die. Jesus, I'm going with you to the very end. And then he denies him once and then twice, three times. Denies even having ever known the man. And Peter and the rest of the disciples were nowhere to be seen when Jesus stood before Pilate at first light, when Jesus was flogged and scourged, and finally when he was taken to Golgotha and he was crucified. And when Jesus died about 3 p.m. on Good Friday, it was the women and the believing member of the Sanhedrin, Joseph of Arimathea, who provided Jesus with a tomb and ensured that he would be buried before sundown in full accordance with the Jewish law. Joseph was a prominent member of the Sanhedrin, showing us that Jesus Christ, uh, his magnetism, his power to save anyone and everyone uh, was at work already. And Joseph of Arimathea uh, had elite status with a tomb, and he gave that tomb for Jesus' body. This is Mark 15, 42. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should, should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. And that's where our text picks up in verse 1 of chapter 16. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Think about how much they wanted to do this anointing on the Sabbath, but they waited. They knew Jesus would want them to keep the Sabbath day holy because Jesus had kept the Sabbaths holy, devoting one full day each week to the worship of God. Uh, we celebrate the Sabbath on a Sunday, not a Saturday. On a Sunday as the first day of the week. Why do we do that? Because of the Lord's resurrection. This was noted uh, by Jewish rabbis of the day who called Sunday the day of the Christians. But the very first Christians were all Jews. They were Jewish people who worshiped God on a Saturday. And the fact that Jews would switch the day of the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday is one of the greatest proofs for the fact of the resurrection. And it's also a reminder to us as followers of Christ that Sunday is our Sabbath and we are to devote Sundays to worshiping the Lord resting in him and serving his body. And by rising from the dead on a Sunday, Jesus Christ has blocked off a day of your week, every week, for you to come and worship God with the people of God. And now that the Sabbath was over, the women finally uh, get to work. They spring into action. They bought the aromatic spices when commerce resumes on Saturday night. Uh, and the fact that the women were worried about caring for Jesus' body shows that they had no expectation whatsoever that he would rise from the dead. But it is clearly true that they truly loved Jesus and they wanted to make sure that he was properly anointed. The place of women as eyewitnesses of the resurrection, as the first eyewitnesses, has long been noted as a powerful argument for the historicity of the gospel's accounts. For no one in that age inventing such a story and wanting to be taken seriously would rest its credibility on the testimony of women. Judaism did not accept the testimony of women in court, so the early church would scarcely have placed them at the tomb unless their presence was a brute fact of history. And why were they there? Because the disciples were not. The disciples had fled. The disciples still had not received that resurrection of the soul that they needed. And just after uh, verse 2, it says, Very early on the first day of the week when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. Just after sunrise, they visit the tomb. And the time note, the time notice is a realistic detail. Uh, it would have been best to prepare the body, which had already been lying in the ground for over a day before the temperature arose. 
And the phrase here for when the sun had risen, uh, it's taken on symbolic detail as a metaphor for Jesus' own rising. When he was on the cross, there was three hours of darkness, of palpable darkness, all throughout Jerusalem, most likely all throughout Israel. And now that darkness has been countered with the light of day. Uh, the sun has risen with healing in its wings. Psalm 30 says in verse 4, Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night. But joy comes with the morning. And the women suddenly recall as they're going to anoint Jesus uh, that there's a practical obstacle in the way before they perform, perform their last service for him. They remember the stone in verse 3. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us and from the entrance of the tomb? Uh, if you've ever been racked with grief, you know that in that state of mind, logistics and details of logistics are the furthest thing from your mind. Uh, and that's perhaps why they forgot about the stone. Uh, what kind of stone was this? It was a massive stone. Uh, the stones that we uh, people have found are from that time between 1,500 to 3,000 pounds. This thing's massive. You have to use levees and animals and ropes in order to move them. Uh, and the stone was to cover... The tomb, the tombs were actually narrow burial niches that were carved out of the stone, usually two by two by six feet in size, in size were, and they were cut horizontally into the walls of the burial chamber. And the body would then be placed inside. The tomb would be sealed so that no one could steal, uh, so no one could steal the tomb. And that was the, the problem in that day, that's why the stones were placed there, uh, because people would steal tombs. Tombs were really expensive when someone dies, and they're like, well, let's go to one of the elite person's tombs. They'd move the stone, or they tried to, and they'd steal the body, throw it away, and put another person's body inside. So that's why the stones were there to protect from the tomb robbers. Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? They didn't have the necessary equipment, the levers, the ropes, the animals. Uh, and so their utterance here is more of a lament than a real question. This is a real need. And if they had only known that the resurrection had already made all of their cares, all of their anxieties unnecessary, that which they themselves could never do, God had already done for the stone was very large and it has already been rolled away. Mark doesn't mention the earthquake and the angelic visitation which had Move this stone according to Matthew 28, 2. As usual, he restricts himself to the bare facts necessary for the story. In verse 4, and looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. Uh, the stone had been rolled back by the angel, and that's the young man in verse 5. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. Most likely this is an angel, and we see the same pattern in the other angelophanies in Scripture where angels appear, and the people that see the angel, the intrepidation, they fall on the ground, and he says, fear not, assures them. Uh, and we see the same pattern here as well. And what's he doing? He's sitting. He's sitting on the right side. He's just hanging out, just enjoying himself. Uh, why? Because he's, he knows exactly what happened. Victory has been won. A sitting is a posture, especially on the right side, a posture of victory, of auspiciousness, of power. In verse 6, and he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid, where they laid him. Uh, he invites them in to gaze into the empty space uh, to see with their own eyes, to see proof that Jesus Christ's body is gone. Why? Because he's risen. And he tells them that you're seeking Jesus of Nazareth. That's exactly who they, they were looking for. They weren't looking for the Son of God. They weren't looking for the resurrected Lord. They were looking for Jesus of Nazareth, a man who had died a Friday afternoon and was buried in this tomb. They were looking for a body. And the angel knows exactly what he's doing, and he utters these beautiful words that become so significant to the church. He is not here. He has risen. In the Eastern church in particular, this has become something of a liturgical form, especially at Easter. The so-called Pascal greeting is uh, in the Greek, Christos Anesti, Alethos Anesti, he is risen. He is risen indeed. 
Uh, Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified, he has risen. He remains the crucified one. Jesus, when he comes out of the tomb, he still had wounds. He still had marks, proof uh, that uh, nails were punctured, uh, had punctured his body. Uh, now what does this have to do with me? What does this have to do with you, that Jesus Christ has come back from the dead? Well, it has everything to do with us. Because with the same power that God resurrects Jesus Christ, God must resurrect your soul. And how does God resurrect your soul? By giving you grace to believe that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Romans 10.9 says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord... And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And that faith is a gift, and that faith is a regenerating power, the same power that raised Christ from the dead. And that brings us to the second resurrection. The second resurrection is built on the first one. What is resurrection? It's an act of rising from the dead. Uh, And there was a second resurrection, and the second resurrection is linked to the resurrection of Christ. And that's the resurrection of your soul and of your spirit. The first resurrection is that of Christ bodily. And the second resurrection in the scriptures is that of your own soul and of your own spirit. When Satan comes to tempt Jesus Christ in the wilderness at the beginning of his ministry, uh, Jesus responds to Satan's temptation by quoting the word of God. He says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Meaning... That we're not just physical. If we were just physical, then food would be, bread would be enough to sustain us. He says, no, for, for true life, you need more than just bread. You need something. You need the word of God. What's the word of God for? It's to nourish our souls. Which shows us that, um, friends, you're more than just physical. You have an everlasting soul. The question is, is your soul alive toward God? Is your soul beating toward God? You see, there's an inner man, and that's uh, what Scripture talks about in Genesis, where it says, in the beginning, God created everything, and then God, out of uh, the dust, creates Adam, and it says, man was breathed into by the Spirit of God, and man became a living being. That's what was called the soul or the spirit of man. God, who was a spirit, is a spirit, breathes into the flesh of Adam, and that flesh becomes a living spirit. And then Scripture says in the next two chapters of Genesis that when Adam and Eve rebelled against God, they lost their perfect communion with God. They lost their perfect relationship with God because God is holy and righteous, and they had sinned. And Scripture says that when Adam sinned, that he died. Well, so how did he die? He was kicked out of the Garden of Eden. How did he die? He didn't physically die, no. But he died on the inside toward God. His soul died toward God. Are you beginning to understand something about the resurrection of the soul? That death comes upon the soul. That death is a condition. And the condition is that a man is separated from God. He's placed out of the garden. He no longer has communion and fellowship with God. And this is condition Scripture calls death. Because it... Scripture teaches the soul that sins shall surely die. And that's what's wrong with every single one of us, apart from the grace of God. We've lost our God. We've lost our way. G.K. Chesterton said, Whatever else you say about man, this is surely obvious. He is not what he ought to be. We need a resurrection of the soul. And it's the same thing the disciples needed. In Mark 16, 7, the angel says, But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. The women are told, don't remain here. Don't remain fixated on the empty tomb. You have a job to do. Bring this message to the disciples. And Jesus had uh, predicted all of this in Mark 14, 26. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the mountain of olives. And Jesus said to him, to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. He said this when they were in Gethsemane and in their sleepy and disoriented condition. They didn't make sense of what was happening. And I love how the angel says, go tell his disciples and Peter. And in the Greek, there's a double entendre here. What does it mean, and Peter? The word uh, can be translated especially or even, 
or both, especially even or both. And the sly addition of and to Peter is a double entendre. On the one hand, of course you're supposed to announce this message to Peter. He's the first apostle, right? He's, he's the one that Jesus chose first in Galilee. He's the first one that will see the, the resurrection appearance of Jesus Christ. Of course, especially. He's number one. He's the leading apostle. Um, but also, it might mean even, even to Peter. Why even to Peter? Well, Peter, uh, after he had confessed that Jesus was the Messiah, and then Jesus says, well, because I'm the Messiah, I'm going to the cross, I'm going to die. And Peter says, no, 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 no you're never going to die. And then Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. So we see that he did not truly understand what Jesus had come to do. Even to Peter, go tell him. And then Peter, after his protestation of eternal faithfulness, Jesus, I'm never going to leave you. He goes and denies uh, Jesus Christ. And the other disciples seeing the denial of Peter, uh, Peter's denial of Jesus, they do the same. But it is precisely to this wayward disciple who recognized neither his need for Jesus to die on the cross for his sins, nor he, did he understand human sinfulness. To this man, Jesus Christ is, uh, so to speak, stretching out a hand of reconciliation from the grave. And the very fact that these instructions were given to the women to take to Peter is an utterly remarkable fact. Denial after denial when Jesus needed him most. And here's the angel informing the women that Jesus has not given up on Peter. The fact that the very fact that Peter was not cast away is a sign of God's grace towards sinners. After all, that's exactly why Jesus Christ came to die. He came to live, he came to die, and he was crucified to pay as a ransom for many, including Peter. Uh, Jesus was raised from the dead as a sign that his death turned aside the wrath of God towards sinners. And the empty tomb, well, it's proof that he wasn't just a messianic pretender as Pilate thought or a blasphemer as the Sanhedrin had declared. No, Jesus Christ is the living son of the living God, and he's proven it. Now, perhaps you find yourself here today in church, perhaps for the first time in a long time. Uh, perhaps you have also confessed Jesus Christ, been baptized even. You said, yeah, I'm going to follow Jesus the rest of my days. And perhaps you have denied him. Action by action, word by word, denied him, perhaps with your lifestyle. Well, today, friends, this message isn't especially for you. It's not even for you. This message is even for you and especially, it's for us. It's especially for us, praise be to God. It's a message that we all need grace. If the number one apostle can be forgiven for denying the Son of God, after walking with him for three days, if there's grace for this guy, there's grace for every single one of us, we just need to receive it. And that's how you get this resurrection of the soul. You realize that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. That was him. He was being crucified for me, for my denial, for my betrayal, for my sin. Well, of course he's going to forgive me. Look what he went through for me. Of course, Jesus, I repent, and of course I follow you. Let us marvel at the exceeding kindness of God towards his backsliding servants. And if that's you, if you've backslidden, well, slide right back in. Slide back into the church of Christ. And he says he's going before you. That means, Peter, you're going to need an encounter with the risen Christ if you are going to be everything that God has created you to be. This is why each person needs to receive a resurrection of the soul. In verse 8, they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. The women were given a task, go and deliver the message. And instead they flee from the tomb in terror and say nothing to anybody. And this fear and this flight is easy to understand. This is something they've never encountered. The sheer unexpectedness of these events and the impression of supernatural power at work causes fear in them. For they were afraid. Their silence is more difficult to explain. Though it seems to be ironically Related to the fact that Jesus, earlier on, when he says, when he would heal people and the time for revelation had not yet come, he says, don't tell anyone. And when the time for revelation had come, they don't tell anyone. 
Uh, this is part of the secret of the kingdom of God, that even to share that message, that there is such a resistance to share that message, you need the power of God uh, to do it. Uh, the book of Mark ends not on a note of bold proclamation, but on one of fearful silence and flight. How come all of Jerusalem didn't hear about the resurrection immediately? That Sunday morning, as soon as they walked into the tomb, they see the angel, Jesus isn't here. All right, the angel confirmed, the body is not here. We're going to tell everybody. But they don't do that. Surely a bunch of hysterical women rushing through the streets of Jerusalem early in the morning, screaming about a resurrection. Everyone would have known in an instant. And the answer here is they didn't do it immediately because they were afraid. And why were they afraid? Because they hadn't been resurrected from the inside yet. Their soul hadn't been resurrected by the power of the Holy Spirit just yet. And that's our condition. Our condition apart from Christ, apart from the Holy Spirit regenerating us, is that we are dead in our sins. Our soul is dead to God. Look at Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And the second resurrection is crucial because if you do not have the second resurrection, when the third resurrection comes, you are going to spend eternity in an eternal physical body outside of the presence of God. This is the third resurrection, and that's the resurrection of your body. The first resurrection is the act of rising from the dead of the Lord Jesus Christ. The second resurrection is that of your soul from the dead and brought back to God and being alive with him. The third resurrection is the resurrection of the body, your body, my body. When Jesus Christ came forth from the grave, Scripture says he had marks in his hands and his feet. It was a bodily resurrection, and it was his body that was linked to a body that he had before. It was similar, it was linked, but it was glorified, it was transformed. Uh, he had a true body in the glorified state. Uh, he ate fish. He wasn't a phantom. He wasn't a ghost. He ate fish. And then finally, he said, this body, uh, which uh, the previous body could die, this body, the glorified body, does not die. It's a body that lives on for eternity. In John 5, 21 through 29, we see uh, the development of this idea. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, and those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Meaning on the day of resurrection, everybody, everyone, everyone with the body, everybody is going to be reunited with his or her soul. And then 
comes the everlasting separation. Those whose souls were not resurrected in this life, resurrected to live for God, those souls in those bodies, eternal bodies, are going to live on in a place called hell, a place of suffering, outer darkness, of turmoil. And the description of those who live in that eternal state, well, they're suffering forever. They, they would long to cease existing, but they will not cease existing. And this, my friend, this is crucial because you read this passage and you're like, those who have done evil will be resurrected to judgment. Well, who hasn't done evil? Who hasn't done evil? Every single one of us has done evil. So what do we need? We need someone to remove that evil, remove the condemnation, remove the wrath of God that we deserve. And that happens the very moment that you repent of your sins. You turn to Jesus Christ, the resurrected Christ who had been crucified, and you say, Lord Jesus, please forgive me. Lord Jesus, have mercy upon my soul. Resurrect my soul so that when my body is resurrected, I will spend eternity with you. Uh, if you notice, I didn't read Mark 16, 9 through 20. Uh, and if in, in your Bible, most likely there's a footnote around verse 9 uh, and parentheses. And they say something like, the, the best manuscripts and the oldest manuscripts do not contain this text. Uh, Matthew and Luke follow Mark's narrative closely up to chapter 16, verse 8. And beyond it, they diverge radically, suggesting that their version of Mark didn't contain anything subsequent to 16, Eight. Uh, our earliest and best Greek manuscripts that we have, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, uh, and the over 100 Armenian manuscripts and the two oldest Georgian manuscripts, uh, they, they don't have this text. And the two oldest and the most important early manuscripts of the Bible, both from the 4th century, they omit 16.9 through 20. A number of the church fathers, Clement and Origen, who quote from Mark, Never mentioned the longer uh, ending. And the two most famous biblical scholars of the early church, Eusebius and Jerome, were both aware of the longer ending, uh, but they never used it and they didn't believe it to be original. Uh, Eusebius, for example, writes in 2 Marinus, the accurate ones of the copies of Mark end with the women running away from the tomb. And this testimony is seconded in Jerome and Severus of Antioch. My question as I was preparing this text is, why would anyone ever be tempted? Like if, the, if that ending from 9 through 20 isn't original, why would anyone be tempted to end the book differently? Why? Because you get to verse 8 and you say, that's it? That's the ending? Women running from the tomb in fear and remaining silent. And many exegetes convinced that the gospel could not have terminated with the women running away and remaining silent. They hypothesized that perhaps Mark was arrested uh, or something, some mishap happened right when he got to verse 8, which seems a bit too convenient. Uh, it seems reasonable to see that the longer ending was an attempt to round off the gospel whose uh, ending didn't feel adequate. Uh, the text is like the story of the woman caught in adultery in John 8, 1 through 11, an example of Christian tradition which may well be genuine and undoubtedly early, but does not belong in the actual gospel as it stands. Uh, do, do we have any other parallels in Scripture of an unsatisfying ending to a book? Yeah, we have multiple. If you study the narrative from Deuteronomy to 2 Kings, uh, you see that Israel is taken to Babylonian captivity, and you expect that by the end of the 2 Kings that they had, they had returned, and that's what the book would ended with. That's not what it ends with. Uh, in the New Testament, for example, the book of Acts, which is the second volume of Luke's two volumes, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. How does that book end? Well, it ends with, Peter, uh, with Paul in prison. And it says that he just continued ministering the Gospel while in prison teaching about the kingdom of God. Luke doesn't say what happened at the end of those two years. But every reader, original reader, would know exactly what happened to Paul after those two years which he, he was executed, he was martyred. Uh, the most uh, suggestive biblical parallel of an unsatisfying ending is the Old Testament book of Jonah, which ends very abruptly, very puzzling. Uh, Jonah initially called by God to go preach to the people of Nineveh, Israel's ancient enemy. 
Uh, he himself repents in the belly of a sea creature, is given a second chance to fulfill his commission. And then uh, when he goes to Nineveh, he preaches a sermon, uh, probably one of the shortest sermons ever preached, repent or you're all going to die. And uh, everyone there, just everyone got saved. The spirit moved, the whole city got saved. And uh, did Jonah say, oh, tremendous, uh, let's have a worship service to the Lord? No, he got so angry. He got livid. Uh, he goes outside the city, and he's just sitting there uh, moaning. Um, and God responds in the book's concluding words by alluding to the plant that he had sent to protect Jonah from the sun. Uh, Jonah 4.10, and the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle. The end. And that's how the book ends. You know, what, what happened to Jonah? Did Jonah repent? Did Jonah finally come to his senses that the same God who poured out his grace on Nineveh uh, pours out his grace on Jonah? Is that how? Uh, it, no, we, we don't get any of the details. However, the fact that the book of Jonah exists, who wrote the book of Jonah? Jonah. Jonah wrote the book of Jonah. The fact that the book exists is proof that Jonah had been reconciled with God. That Jonah finally understood that everybody needs grace. And that it is God's mercy that anyone gets saved at all. Uh, and Jonah doesn't want to end the book talking about how he came to his senses. Or talking about how he finally uh, came to the awareness of the truth of God. No, Jonah wanted to end the book emphasizing the graciousness of God. That even to a recalcitrant, stubborn, stiff-necked prophet, a man of God, you're supposed to know God's Even this guy needs grace. Uh, and what a gracious God that he would extend grace uh, to even Jonah. And that's exactly what's happening with the Gospel of Mark. Who wrote the Gospel of Mark? Mark. Whose disciple was Mark? Mark was Peter's disciple. Peter could have ended the, the text and said, you know what, the women went to Peter and Peter got on his knees and said, Lord Jesus, forgive me for my denial of you. Uh, and then he could have ended like John 21 where he goes on a, a walk on the beach with Jesus. I love that, very romantic. Uh, and then Jesus makes them breakfast, Easter breakfast. That's how it should have. No, no, no. Peter says, if I'm going to write a gospel, I'm going to make God look so great. I'm going to make myself look realistic in need of God's grace, in need of God's love, in need of of God's mercy. Uh, Wellhausen uh, is a commentator and theologian. He famously suggested that the pre present ending lacks nothing. It should be a shame if anything else came afterwards. Did the women go and tell Peter? Of course they did. Something, something helped them overcome their fear. Something helped them overcome the trepidation that had seized them to be silent. Well, well, what was that? That was the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God, the same power that brought Jesus back from the dead. I think this ending is actually one of the most powerful endings, powerful ways of ending uh, the book because it communicates truth by illusion. And illusion can be a more powerful mode of reference than outright description because it creates a sense of colluding all the information against all those, whether in the story or out, who do not get the point. Uh, one of the ways that this illusion works uh, is can be seen by imagining a film about the life of John F. Kennedy uh, that concludes with footage of the fateful visit to Dallas on November 22nd, 1963. Uh, JFK, Jr., uh, JFK, by the way, was from the area. He's a son of Brookline. You can actually go find the house that he uh, grew up on. Actually, on my street, there's a church building in which he was baptized, which I find very interesting because it's no longer a church. It's now a condominium complex uh, with celestial ceilings. Very beautiful. And, uh, and that's kind of the story of the church in Boston, uh, this is a, a place where a lot of very influential people are trained up. And uh, the, the church was strong for a while and then stopped preaching the word of God, lost the power of God, and the church buildings are turned into condominiums. We have Mosaic. We have the, other, the opposite problem. 
Uh, we do not have a church building. Uh, we are actually uh, in the middle of a building campaign in which we are trying to accumulate funds uh, to buy commercial space at a condominium center, a condominium complex, to turn into a church. We're trying to re reverse the curse. Uh, so uh, if, if you want more details about our building campaign, uh, we have these little bookmarks for you. Uh, Boston Kingdom Builders, very nice. Uh, don't just change lives, transform eternities. Uh, MosaicBoston.com slash build. Uh, if you go to the website, there's actually a, a video uh, and content that will be added. Uh, back to the illusion story to understand what's happening. Just imagine a, a, a film where it's the story of JFK, and you, you know where this is going. You know on what happened on November 2nd, 1963. And in the movie, you can see the motorcade threading its way through the streets of downtown Dallas. And President and Mrs. Kennedy sit in an open convertible, waving happily to the crowds in the bright sunshine. And there the movie ends. There's no depiction of the gunshots ringing out, of the president slumping forward, of the limousine suddenly picking up speed, of the first lady cradling the president's head in her lap. But these events are all the more powerfully evoked by not being portrayed because everyone knows what happens next. And that's kind of how Mark ends the story. It's the tomb. It's empty. The women, they're scared. The disciples, they're scared. Everyone's in trepidation. Everyone's silent. But we know what happened next because Peter, spineless Peter, turns into a steel-spined proclaimer of the Word of God. The very first time he preaches a sermon filled with the Holy Spirit, 3,000 people got saved on the day of Pentecost. How did that happen? How did that guy do that? By the power of God, the same power that resurrected Christ, the same power resurrected Peter's soul and spirit and that of the other disciples. And that same power is given to us today. If a film were to be made of Mark's gospel, uh, the camera at the end would record the women running away from the door of the tomb in panic. It would then, however, remain fixed on that dark aperture for a long time before the fade out. The women run away. You hear their footsteps fading uh, and their terrified cries gradually fading out. And the viewers are left confronted with the mystery, with the secret of the tomb, what does this mean? Well, this is the beginning of it, that we worship a living God. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the, of the living God. And with the same power that he rose from the dead, with that same power, he can save absolutely anybody. Peter, Joseph of Arimathea, people in Boston today, God can save everybody with the same miraculous power. The fact that Jesus Christ came back from the dead demonstrates his deity, underscores the validity of everything he taught, and also assures us that there is a way for us to be saved. There is a way for us to be reconciled. There is a way for us to spend eternity with Jesus Christ uh, because it's true. See, Peter didn't want you to base your faith on Peter's faith. No, that's not enough of a foundation. Peter didn't want you to base your faith on the women's faith. Peter wanted you to base your faith on the power of God. He wanted you to base your faith on the fact of God, that all of this, all of this is true. And the open door of the tomb, what does it do? It confronts us with evidence that demands a verdict. You have to make a decision. Do I believe this? Do I believe that Jesus Christ really rose from the dead? And if I do, then what does that mean? That means he's Lord. That means he saved you from your sins. He's Lord of your life. And because he's Lord of your life, he's given us marching orders. The marching orders are go and make disciples of all nations by the power of the Holy Spirit. It, it would have been a greater miracle to invent the life of Jesus Christ than to have lived it. Mark's gospel is just the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. And we take it up today where Mark leaves it. That same power we have access to. And when we proclaim the word of God, people really do get saved. I've seen this over a decade long of ministry in a place like Boston. You preach the word of God. I get up here. I say the word of God. And, and, and the dry bones come alive. All I'm doing is come alive, come alive, come alive. That's, that's all I'm doing. He's alive. You're alive. Everyone's alive. That's all I'm doing. But it's not me. It's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit saves you. And you're like, what happened? I think I love Jesus. Yes, that's what happened. 
Because he's risen. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Christ is risen. And Christ is risen. Amen. Now let's live like it. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the Holy Scriptures, and we thank you for the Holy Spirit. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are with us today. Lord, you love your church. You identify so closely with your church that when you met Paul for the first time, you still Saul. He hadn't experienced the resurrection of the soul, uh, of the soul. and Lord, you saved him. You met him, and you said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Not the church, me. And then, Lord, we thank you for resurrecting Saul and turning him to Paul. And we thank you uh, that you uh, can do that to every single one of us. And I pray, Lord, that you do, that you do continue to save many in this great city. Continue to pour out your mercy. Continue to have pity on this great city. And use us in the process and make us steel spine proclaimers of the word of God, knowing it's absolutely true, all of it's true. In Jesus' name we pray.